All right. So, I'll be able to see. Yeah, just giving you that. Maybe we got people coming in and off. So, all right. Okay, welcome everybody to um, this year's National Biodiversity Teach In. Uh, this is our last presentation of the day. And thank you for coming on. Today, February 9th, when we're observing International Day of Women and Girls in Science. We're your hosts, Lorelai and Caitlin. And now to introduce your presenter from Illinois DNR of Wildlife, Nikki Straw. On the human dimension to wildlife. Feel free to ask questions throughout the presentation. Nikki will answer them all at the end. All right, Nikki, you've got the floor. All right, thank you guys. Well, I should say gals. Um, thank you so much for having me today. And I hope um, that you guys find a little bit of interest in this. Um, wildlife uh, can be such a very broad, unique um, topic. And I understand that I'm going to have a whole plethora of um, or a whole wide variety of people tuning in, tuning in from um, elementary school on up through, through um, high school. So hopefully there'll be some areas of this presentation that, that challenge you a little bit. Um, some areas that may um, be old school or old hat to you, you may already know. Um, so bear with me as I try to educate everyone because I think I have one of the most unique jobs um, and doing this is actually the most unique portion of my job, I think, because it helps to educate as many people as I can to kind of bring a little bit better of an understanding of what I mean when I say a human dimensions, because it wildlife is such a wide topic, like I said, um, when you put the human element into it, it just became becomes a whole new ball game. Um, and with that, just like um, they had said, my name is Nikki Strong. I'm with the Illinois DNR, wildlife biologist for Cook and DuPage. So if you guys are in those areas, feel free to call me anytime. But I'm also the hunter heritage for the northern portion of the state. I love to be able to know who I'm dealing with. And I realize that not everybody um, on the... Um, out there. Um, I know I can't see anybody, I don't think. So I'm kind of running this um, with blind, but I like to know who people are. So even though I can't necessarily see you, I'd love to think about, um, I, I'd love to have you guys think about where you kind of consider yourself um, in this. Does anybody out there consider themselves a preservationist? And if not, maybe a conservationist. Or do you just enjoy going outdoors and enjoy that outside? If there's any hunters out there, that's always great to know as well. And I always love putting in poacher because I find that a lot of people are, they just didn't know it. Um, this is where my two children usually tend to raise their hands with the big old grin on their face because they've heard me do this presentation just a few times. Um, but to kind of go through what I mean by all of these things, the pres and this is kind of setting the framework for um, everything. Um, the focus is not so much the um, quantity, but whether rather the quality of the outdoor environment. So when you're a conservationist, you actually plan to utilize the natural resources that are out there. You don't wanna exploit them, you don't wanna destroy them, but you don't wanna neglect them or let them to go wild either. Um, that's, that's not necessarily what we talk about when we're talking about conservation. It's that planned use of them. So again, the quality, we want the quality to be high not necessarily just make sure we have everything possibly out there. Um, the key is the sustaining of healthy populations. Um, that is, this is the definition 
oops, sorry, that is the definition by the Pittman-Robertson Act. Um, but you can find more information there if you're of the high school level or higher and um, interested in grabbing some of that information. Um, but it's to sustain the healthy populations of wildlife. So I like to condense it down from that to here, to what I like to think of it is, is a balanced use of natural resources. Preservation, on the other hand, though, is to ensure that everything stays alive. It is that quantity focus, making sure we have everything, not necessarily that anything is healthy or anything is um, um, performing to their optimum level, but rather they're at least alive. Everything out there is alive. Um, so it's the non-use of any natural resource, whether it's good or bad. A hunting, many people know, many people think they know what hunting is, but really there is so much more to hunting than the actual, um, when you're out in the field in the moment of harvesting an animal. That's only one aspect of hunting. There's the entire process of hunting is a very long, almost year round endeavor that people choose to go on with. And the interesting thing I found that in Merriam-Webster, the dictionary, there's even hunting being used as in machining terms. And I thought that continuous attempt to automatically control a system by finding a desired equilibrium. I thought that was really quite interesting to um, to see. Granted, again, this is in a, a concept of a machine, um, but hunting in machining terms is to find an equilibrium condition. And this is where poaching comes into play, to trespass or to take. However, Illinois statute does say that, define the word take as even attempting to do so. So this is where my kids jump into play. Um, anybody out there who has ever picked the wildflowers when you're out on a hike for your mom or dad, that even trying to pick them and not quite being able to cut it all the way, um, that is even technically poaching. So unless you have prior permission to harvest those wildflowers, that is one of those poaching um, things. So no matter how you use your resources, whether you are poaching, don't worry, I won't tell anyone, or um, you do like to give back and plant trees or head out and go birding to see what's out there, um, build bird boxes, actually use, harvest some of the timber that might be on land somewhere, or like I said, you're my kids and harvest and harvesting poaching a bunch of wildflowers or even getting out and hunting yourselves there's a lot of different things we can do to help that desired equilibrium some things knowing what you can and cannot take is also very good and that's where we come into native versus non-native and the protections are all different but generally speaking native wildlife is the protected and when I'm talking native, I when especially when it comes to hunting, I'm specifically talking game species and migratory birds. So, I mean, if we're really trying to get technical, then there's all that. Don't worry, there's no quiz on all those species. My short version though, is anything that was here when the indigenous people were the only human impact on the local ecosystem, that's what I like to consider native. I get in a lot of fights over other ecologists though over native versus non-native. So this is what the NRCS um, figured Illinois looked like back during those um, pre-settlement conditions. And why it all matters is because we all need to take a moment. Um, for those of you um, that might be in high school or older, um, that you guys might know of John Muir and Aldo Leopold. But I love some of these quotes like, come to the woods for here is rest. Because of a lot of different 
reasons and that I'll get to next. But an old friend of mine, well, an old friend of mine once said, God is in the energy between us and all that is around us. And I always thought that was really deep, especially because he was only, we were only in high school at that time. But it stuck with me throughout, even when um, I read this next quote, if an animal gives its life to feed me, I'm in turn bound to support its life. If it receive, if I receive the gift of the stream of pure water, then I am responsible for returning that gift in kind. An integral part of humans' education is to know those duties and how to perform them. And the more we get out, and the more we see on and uh, get outdoors and see these things firsthand the more likely we are to be able to hold on to those moments and remember those moments that we had now as a child for you guys. And as you age, you will be able to have you, you may have fewer and fewer of those moments, especially if what recent studies have found, everybody is being on their computers and screen time so much more, which is in the left-hand column. I don't know if you guys can see my, my, um, mouse or not but in the left hand column that is where we're getting all that screen time the older we're getting the more and more screen time we're having and the less and less time we're getting outdoors and being able to enjoy and see firsthand these moments that will help shape the rest of our lives and yet even though more and more people, especially kids. Now, mind you, these are eight to 12 year olds. So I don't know how many eight to 12 year olds we have in the audience yet. But if you do think about how much do you think playing in the outdoors and nature has helped each one of you guys in growing up. And if you can see the majority of people all find that it's so important to get outdoors and into nature and yet we're doing it a little fewer and fewer times but that's why i'm here hopefully to help spread the news and let people know that we need to get out there more and that more importantly we need to be able to properly manage all these resources so you guys can enjoy them for the rest of your lives the Illinois, that's why the Illinois Wildlife Action Plan was actually designed to help guide the conservation of these wildlife species, as well as their habitats. So not just the, the animals that live on the land, but the habitats that they live in. But what had happened and why do we have to worry about that? And where do we go from here is going to be so important. We had quite a Native American presence. They did a lot of that balancing, like I said in the beginning, that that equilibrium um, was found. And when they when over harvest or overuse happened, they moved on to a different area so that they can um, continue the existence that they had. When Illinois, um, when people did start settling Illinois, they realized all the way back in the 1700s that things were not as open and free as everybody thought that they might be. So they even, the French even started putting down rules as early as 1700 that said that you could not log unless you were trying to build a fort. You could not use the lumber and the timber so readily for things like firewood because they realized that there was a limited commodity. And yet in 1901, somebody one wrote, uh, his, you know, from the Historical Encyclopedia of Illinois, one can scarcely travel without finding, sorry, a prodigious multitude of turkeys that helped keep together, that kept together in flocks, often to the number of 10 hundred. So a large amount of wildlife was around, but by about the 1900s, that's when they're really starting to see devastation here in Illinois. Now this, that quote, we don't, I don't know exactly where those people were when they saw that much turkey, that many turkeys. But by about the 1900s, 
there were only two, if I recall correctly, there were only two recorded herds remaining. One at what we now call Horseshoe Lake, and the other was in Ogle County. I think it's somewhere in the White Pines area. There were two maternal herds left. And now, from all of the things that we've done, going from that devastation, that was so drastically reduced by settlement settlers in our area, as well as harvesting. Granted, some of us needed to feed ourselves, but when you get to this kind of level, it got that got to be too much, and it was no longer a sustainable equilibrium. But now we're facing a, a wildlife disease transmission issue. There's so many of them in such a small area that the spreading of the disease and the mutations and things like that that happen are so much more relative so much more prevalent than if it was in a balanced state. All of that kind of came to be because of a lot of different things from the Lacey Act in the 1900s. So this is what started it, really. This is what kind of, the Lacey Act is what kind of got um, the awareness that wildlife is a, is a finite amount of things just like the trees that they noticed in the 1700s, a lot of things kind of developed in, from those realizations. So they passed the law to prohibit any of the trades of wildlife, fish, and plants. And it was now illegal to take, if you recall the, the definition of take, so even attempting to harvest, um, possess, transport, or sell uh, wildlife, fish, and plants, it became a, a ticketable offense. In 1903, that's when the Game Commission had started, as well as some of our, um, some of the other big state parks started coming onto, into play. In 1927, Horseshoe Lake was the first wildlife refuge in Illinois. And in the 1930s, if you, if those of you who are around um, that might know, or the high school students possibly, if there's any younger generation um, out there that know San Colony Almanac with Aldo Leopold, kudos to you, I appreciate it. Um, but if you haven't heard of it, it might be worth um, a read because Aldo Leopold is kind of the one considered the father of conservation um, because he did feel that there was a state of harmony between men and land. We did not, we don't need to specifically pull apart wildlife and human habitation. We can try to find that balance between wildlife and our land use. And he was credited with the framing concepts of the land ethic and management of the entire biotic community, rather than just one species or one area or one consideration. He came to the realization that everything needed to be in my, kept in mind. And this is actually quite unique to North America. This is where the Pittman-Robertson Federal Aid in the Wildlife Restoration Act actually started. So a lot of those funds are derived from the federal excise tax, and we'll kind of get into that later, but there's a, some of the taxes, if you guys have ever heard you know, people complain about taxes, some of those taxes actually are going towards the benefit for wildlife, the um, many multi-state conservation grants, um, many program administration and other kinds of um, projects, including safety projects, safety instructions and education um, and wildlife restoration grants that really help to put the boots on the ground for wildlife conservation. 
But Leopold saw that the changes were happening and knew that conservation was needed to happen then. Otherwise, it needed to happen in conjunction with, you know, starting then in conjunction with all the industrialization, all the agricultural techniques that were being developed and just the general population expansion. Conservation had to be balanced between the path between where they were in the 1930s and where we have gone. The map on the left in the early 1800s, that kind of brown tan, was the original prairie and grasslands. It's where we got our, you know, the prairie state came from, was because most of the land of Illinois was a prairie or grassland. Now, if you fast forward to the present day on the right, that yellow is not prairie. Yellow is intentionally um, agriculture. 98% of the land in Illinois is now privately owned. All of that is brought into um, a whole different kind of question then why is it important to remember where we came from and where we're on track to go in the future. It's because this is the current, we are literally living the current situations, not the past, not the future. We're living the here and now. And the, the wildlife markets are still present, but they're protected in an ethical, sustainable manner with ethical people who are making a living, acquiring products for everybody to legally use in a population, a stable wildlife population-based way. So I don't know if any of you guys like the Renaissance Fair. Um, if you're in Northeastern Illinois, then maybe you guys have heard of Bristol Renaissance Fair. Um, so I go to a couple of different Ren Fairs. Um, and this is where you do see a lot of the wildlife being sold. So you can get a lot of your costuming and, and even a lot of fabrics and things that you might use, le leathers that you might use in some of the costuming and some of your projects, but not just the projects, but also art. It's huge, ha there's just a huge market for art out there. I know I appreciate it. Um, you can't see what's in front and around me, um, but I do have a lot of art throughout my household as well. But there are legal, ethical ways to harvest, to be able to create this beautiful kind of artwork. There's also legal ways to be able to help the, the industries out there to be able to have and utilize animals in a, in a ethical way. The back in, granted the data is a little old, but 19, 2019 and 2020, the there was over six hundred thousand dollars in total value of the pelts sold, blah, sorry, pelts sold by fur takers in Illinois. Fourteen percent of that is in things like what you see here with the Goose Island using the coyote fur, because the coyote fur, especially when it's around your face, um, badger is even better, FYI, but. Um, coyote pelt or native and natural furs when it's around your face in the winter time will help to keep a lot of that moisture from your breathing off your face and reduce the amount of um, ice and pain. I don't know if anybody has had to endure some of the cold weather out there with the with the humidity around your face and cold weather it it ices up and can hurt. But when you have a, a felt um, coyote fur lined, um, I forget what it is, but the hoodie, that, that, that little trim, that's the word I'm looking for, the trim around the hoodie, that's when you're able to um, breathe out and that moisture then adheres to that fur rather than your face keeping you a lot more safe from frostbites and other kinds of winter burns. Um, but also then uh, much more comfortable because you don't have to deal with any of that. But it's, I always found it interesting because just coyote pelts alone were only 
of that 600 and some odd dollars, thousands of dollars. So that's over a quarter million dollars in just Coyote Pout alone. So going forward, um, because of granted the war and the devastation um, over in Russia and China, which is where a lot of our pelts were going to for the fashion industry, obviously that has um, taken a serious drop. But today the pelt values are very low across the board and the demand from the foreign markets that are very volatile because of all these world events. So there's not as many there's not as much money coming into Illinois in order to try to help sustain some of the activities that um, hunters and trappers are able to do for the benefit of everyone. So it is a little discouraging um, to hear that. But, oh, and then there's also illegal things. Sorry, I need a drink. Um, so some things you cannot do, um, for example, you cannot harvest or use or have in your possession things like blue jay feathers. Um, some It's also interesting to know the difference between um, non-native pets and the laws that are under non-native pets are more on one one type of law. So that would be property possession as pets versus cottontail, Eastern cottontail rabbits, which are not pets. These are the native protected species. So the laws that protect the different species are completely different as well. So knowing what the different um, wildlife laws that are out there, or if we're looking at um, personal um, in, I, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know the, I can't remember off the top of my head, the other um, type of, of laws, but we're looking at property possession versus wildlife possession. And in our talks, we're always going to be talking about the wildlife possession, not the pets, because the pets don't have those same wildlife laws. So for example, another another one I could have put up here is a, um, there's a pot belly pig, I guess I just heard, um, potentially in one of the forest preserves up by us. And that pig then has the protections of private property, but not wildlife property. So knowing what regulations are is also really important for the wildlife balance. We need to, we do allow hunting and trapping of all those species that I have had talked to you about already, um, because that's what helps to keep them in balance. We do watch the amount of um, population that's out there. And we do like to try to um, monitor that as much as possible so that we can keep those numbers in a more balanced manner. However, just because we might be trying to balance some species, such as um, goose, they also migrate. And this is where that wildlife conservation model of North America comes into play. It specifically protects each and each, the wildlife to the state of Illinois people. So it's the people, you and me as a person, and your neighbors and your friends, all of you guys individually, independently, have the same right to it. Use to enjoy the, the wildlife as you choose to. However, if you do choose to take wildlife, then that will reduce the ability for other people to enjoy it. Ergo, needing those protections and those regulations and that entire digest um, that you can find, you know, granted this is the 2021-2022 one, you can jump online and find it um, on the Illinois DNR webpage at any time. But as you can see, populations change depending on 
you know, whether they're coming in or out, as time changes, that changes, but not just time changing, but people change too. And I kind of make the joke, can't we all just get along when I bring this um, picture up? Because if the wildlife can figure it out, why can't we? But we are seeing such, like I said in the beginning, an increase in wildlife in certain areas now. We saw that huge increase from the 1900s to now, so much so, like I said, because it's creating some of those diseases now. But especially in municipal and urban environments, where we don't have that human dimension, that human element to try to keep it more in balance, we're now seeing the conflicts between humans and wildlife likely to increase because of human uh, urban sprawl, high and or increasing populations of many types of urban wildlife, and better wildlife habitat as landscape matures for other communities. And that's found in that wildlife damage. You, I didn't show you a picture of it, but again, you can jump on Illinois DNR website and find wildlife damage management in Illinois. And you'll find that those were the three things that they felt that conflicts between humans and wildlife um, and why we're increasing. We have a lot of permits, you know, and, and again, like I said, native wildlife are protected. They have different protections, but we also realize that in some areas, as you can see, raccoons really shouldn't be getting into our buildings. It doesn't bode well for them. It does not bode well for us. It's just a whole lot of bad. So <laughs> we do recognize the need to be able to hand deal with those nuisance as we call it nuisance wildlife as well in order for it to be and again another definition in order for you to have a nuisance wildlife you have to have monetary property damage so there has to be something that the animal physically did in order for you to um trap that animal and we've had all sorts of permits um the highest permitted wildlife has been the raccoon thankfully my little buddy um out my back door is the opossum there weren't as many um permits for those because they do they're not the sharpest tool in the shed they don't they're very transient and they don't really affect much unless you are a horse owner they do they can carry a parasite that can affect horses but they do eat over four thousand ticks in a year and so i don't know about you but i really like that i hate ticks on me and so the, um, our little wildlife, our little opossum buddy really helps. But knowing your wildlife, in all seriousness, their needs, that the food, water, shelter, and space that they need is really the key to learning how to live with wildlife so that all of them can make it an equal comeback. And it's not just a matter of whether we want them or not. It's more we need them so that we can keep and we need them balanced with us so that we can keep the populations within a non-nuisance realm. But we even have otters coming back to live with us. Granted, these guys have yet to become a nuisance that I'm aware of. I've never issued a nuisance permit for the otters, but they are making a comeback and we're really glad to see that. But so did the deer. And now some of the potential undesirable issues are happening. So we see a lot of um, crashes that are involving involve deer. We don't, obviously, that's not something we want to try to encourage. Um, we do see, have a lot of coyotes in the area, even in downtown Chicago. So a lot of people, um, are concerned about that, but the coyotes, they actually do help more than cats with rodent populations in municipal areas. So they help to keep that population explosion of rodents down. And those rodents may be what's contributing to some of the disease spread, for example, ticks. Um, you know, the their primary host are mice. 
that tend to hide in raspberry bushes, multiflora bushes, things like that. Those, the shrubs and things that are protect and protect themselves that animals like coyotes and fox can get into, but things like hawks and owls may not be able to navigate through too readily. Once the ticks drop off the mice, the deer move through the area and the ticks move onto the deer. And now that is that intermediate host before the, it can spread the disease potentially to us. So in the end, coyotes, as they can be a nuisance, sure, but they also can be a huge help to being able to keep the entire balance of everything in check. We even are starting to see things like cougars come back. Cougars, mountain lions, whatever you want to call them. Um, you know, whatever nomenclature suits you best. Um, do you want them here? I understand there's a it's definite scare and concern over these guys, but they also come with their own checks and balances that they can keep animals and other populations better in check than we can. So what happens if you do find wildlife? Oh my gosh, please let it be. Just leave it. First and foremost, if it can move and get around, it probably is fine. We have seen a lot as our population, the human population has changed during COVID. A lot of the wildlife populations now have been having to change as well. They got used to a lot of people going to school or going to work and would come out around that uh, lunchtime kind of time frame as well as in the night. So they were changing from crepuscular more towards noon and midnight because there weren't as many people around. But with COVID and a lot of people now working from home, including myself, on occasion I can work from home or the field or the office, but my time and my daily habits have changed. So, so have now the wildlife that is in my backyard. So first and foremost, leave it be. If it is hurt or something is wrong, then you can jump on the Living with Wildlife um, or wildlifeillinois.org website and find a wildlife rehabilitator. Or there, you can always reach out to me. So I'll show you, I'll put up my contact information again at the end. So you can take a screenshot of that if that would help. But here's the wildlifeillinois.org website. You can get a lot of information from here, whether it's finding a wildlife rehabilitator or trying to get, um, get help or try to figure out what's going on with wildlife in your area or just do a lot of research. But above all, go here first, wildlifeillinois.org, and don't be this guy that I swear I had to call the CPOs on. They may look cute. Do not put them in your car because the mom wasn't around and transport them from Southern Illinois to the Chicagoland region. It doesn't bode well for anybody. So don't be that guy. But we've had so, humans are now undergoing, underusing our resources now, that the wildlife resources. And now there are so many animals in our, the population that we have to now include roadkill reports because cars are creating their own opportunity and their own way to help us deal with the population. So a researcher in Michigan State University said overall, across all animal pairs, a trend was clear. In a relatively pristine habitat, such as our national forests, or like I said, that native area that was managed in a native way, not just left to be preserved, but managed in a native way, roughly six days elapsed on average between paired detections. So two animals at the same time that are predator-prey relationships. In the urban habitats, so more like Chicagoland region, the interval dropped to an average of only four days. Additionally, 
highly antagonistic pairs. So one, one species was likely to kill the other. So like fox and squirrel encounter each other seven additional times more frequently compared to less distributed ones. Even when the animals do not come face to face, simply hearing or smelling a predator can have dramatic effects on the behavior of prey species. So the more we have animals whose populations are become increasing in our urban environment, the more likely we're having those antagonistic pair uh, meetings and the more we're starting to have stressed out, <laughs> I make the joke stressed out animals, but that's what we're dealing because we aren't seeing the starvation with wildlife. We aren't necessarily seeing the accidents that can, that you may have used to keep the surplus in check. The carrying capacity, for those of you who may not know, the carrying capacity is what we can balance versus what the surplus is that is used by the rest of the environment, whether it's predators, um, whether we aren't even seeing too much um, population downtrend because of weather. Um, we are seeing a lot of disease, unfortunately. So here's another way to kind of think of it. As we pour in more babies, more reproduction into the environment, the pot being the environment, we have a little bit of old age starting to come out. Some, some animals die of old age, some animals die of loss of habitat, some because of the weather. But really what we're seeing is this excess population getting more and more and more. And this disease and parasites are starting to become larger and larger. So why do we need to increase some of these? We kicked out the large carnivores, those wolves, the cougars, those that kind of animals that used to keep some of our animals in check. And fences do it to a point of their design, right? But you have to have for it to keep deer out. You're looking at a dual fence row within six feet of each other. And I don't know about you, but just because deer come up to my house and eat the, the ewes right outside my door, doesn't mean I'm gonna put up a double fence all around my house. It's unrealistic. But now we're starting to see a lot of problems with the deer. Back in 2017, this is chronic wasting disease. We did have, we do have it in Illinois. Chronic wasting disease is, or CWD for short, is um, a 100% fatal disease that you can't even see in the deer for most of the time that it's carrying it and spreading it. The top picture is is what appears to be healthy deer. They may or may not have CWD, but that snuzzling and that snuggling um, and all that, that sniffing and how social the deer are, that's how it's passed. And this is an animal within the last week or two of its life, the lower picture then, uh, with CWD. So it does really affect the animal, but it can affect it even when it looks to be perfectly fine. And this was 2017, this is 2023. So as you can see, even though we had, because we had that population explosion of deer, we also have that population explosion of disease. Going back to that North American wildlife, every citizen has the opportunity to hunt. If you remember from earlier, we cannot balance wildlife in Mr. E Leopold's ideals without allowing hunters to balance the urban wildlife populations just as much as the rural areas. We have already created an unbalanced mental regime, pitting us against them even more so in that just opposed position in an us versus them mentality. So why do we need to do it when we're talking about wildlife? It's a public trust. Everybody is entitled to it. And that's why nobody can own wildlife. It can be, they can, you can, if you're a wildlife rehabilitator, you can help fix them up, but then you always let them go for the benefit of you and me and everybody else. 
because of reasons like this. We're looking at much less calories, much higher protein, and a lot more microbes. So these are what's called macronutrients, so fat, calories, proteins. The macronutrients are improved. And what you don't see in this, this infogram is the fact of all the micronutrients that are being, if you consume game species, when you consume game species, because you've helped keep the, that population more in balance, you're starting, you get a lot more micronutrients as well as these macronutrients when they are consumed. And we've also continued to ensure that the terrestrial environment has continued resource for the wildlife. Even preservationists like the Illinois Natural Preservation Act have found a value in maintaining local populations of in unhindered deer and hunting is allowed in many areas due to sensitive plant species for the control of management of the deer population. So even that preservation act, they recognize the value of hunting and needing to keep that balance in check. We've been able to keep things like the Black Crown Land and Marsh Water Reserve in McHenry County. The Illinois did sign on to have a habitat stamp. And like I said, that wildlife action plan is inclu also includes wording over um, management by hunting. A lot of that, if you remember that Pittman Robertson Act money that I had mentioned earlier, um, this is where like 17%, if I if I've and it might be old figures, but 79% of the monetary contributions can go or have gone towards 216 state wildlife areas, many, many different partnerships, many, a lot of conservation reserve program has been enrolled with Pittman Robertson Act. We're able to do things like this habitat cooperator pheasant with cooperation with habitat or pheasants forever. And we need this just as badly because much of us, our wildlife needs to consume invertebrates as well. So we, the more we can save the pollinators, the more we're able to conserve the whole ecosystem too. But a lot of people don't think that they can or what does it matter for conservation of of wildlife, a lot of people enjoy going out and getting outdoors. There's a lot of birders out there. There's a lot of hikers. There's a lot of runners. A lot of people enjoy wildlife management areas, but not many people pay for it. I took out a bunch of slides because I didn't figure you guys really cared about the monetary aspect of it. So if you want, I can go into that later or maybe another time, feel free to reach out. But the short of it is we're looking at something like wildlife watching will bring in $250 billion. Whereas some of, and this is for the, what we could potentially try to help. This is the um, expenditure, I'm sorry, the expenditure for wildlife watching is, $250 billion. And we don't necessarily use, we don't capture any of that for our wildlife conservation at all. Where we, where we pull the money from is from this Pittman-Robertson Act. We get that 11, 10, 11% 11 in tax, which goes towards the Fish and Wildlife Service as well as the Fish and Wildlife and Fish Fund of Illinois, which comes back to the DNR granted so that we can bring it back and put it back into the wildlife so that hunters can come back and purchase more hunting licenses so that we can continue. Granted, this is old numbers, 306 million was um, prior um, many years ago. Now, unfortunately, because we're seeing such a decline in hunters, we're only at 22.5 million as of 2022, and this is why. So as the residents of Illinois increase, the hunting population 
and hunting licenses and hunting revenue decreases. So that money we're able to acquire is becoming less and less and less. Oh, I just jumped, hit the button one too many times, I'm sorry. But our hunting population is not just decreasing, but also the numbers are getting older and succumbing to the unfortunate effects of age, just like all animals. And it all matters because we are trying to conserve and keep things in a balanced manner. This is again, the PR money granted as PR money since it started in 1939, it has grown, but the cost of everything has grown also. So things that can contribute to the funding is something like running to the post office. It is $25, so it is the federal migratory bird stamp or duck stamp, we call it. The $25 duck stamp at the post office is one way that you can help support and contribute to wildlife conservation, as well as even if you may not believe in hunting and may not get out to do hunting, something as simple as a habitat stamp may go may help. Whether we're talking about the, the national federal duck stamp or the Illinois state habitat stamp, those stamps contribute to so much work on the ground that we're able to preserve the land so that we can serve the populations that utilize it. Other ways that you can help is just simply taking up a new sport. Something like, even if you may not, again, enjoy hunting, get out and go scouting, get out and go for hikes, get out and look for the wildlife. Try maybe something like archery that might be able to just do something a little different. Also, there's this new push for locavore. So knowing where your food comes from and having it within a hundred miles of where you live, that has become huge. If you do want to try to get out and become and try hunting, by all means, there's a lot of resources out there like the Learn to Hunt crew or myself. Feel free to contact me. I'll be happy to get you in touch with the Learn to Hunt crew or to at least find an avenue that you might, that might work best for you. But most of all, become an ambassador of conservation. Pass on the desire to get outside. Don't be like those screens, those growing number of, of screen times that we all are seeing. Be the person who gets out, get out, enjoy, find those stories that you can take into the rest of your life and get them passed on to someone else by pulling them out and showing them the difference between conservation and not just preservation. And keep in mind that hunting is more than just the harvest. It's that connection to the land, the connection we have to each other, the connection we have to our natural resources, the wildlife, the plants, the invertebrates, everything that goes onto or into the land is what really will help those goals, whether you're a hunter or a non-hunter, whether you enjoy fishing. If you enjoy even something, that, another amazing sport like falconry, um, it's another form of hunting, but it is just, I think, one of the most unique forms out there. And I look forward to one day potentially becoming a falconer myself. Do you like working your dogs or just going for a hike with your dog? Do you enjoy looking and educating the next generation, your little brother, little sister, or some random stranger that you may notice watching the natural environment? Do you enjoy getting out bird watching yourself? or maybe just even horseback riding or checking out the Tully Monster, the only fossil that's unique just to Illinois. If you enjoy photography, biking, whether it's motorcycle biking or I like pedal biking better, 
hiking and seeing some of the amazing geological formations that we have in Illinois, or just camping, rafting, or just simply being outside, enjoying doing what you like to do the best. We can all try to do our part by not just learning, but also educating others. Doing things like buying a habitat and migratory bird stamp or getting involved with different conservation organizations. They all can help. Whether you're a child or an adult, keep in mind that the guide Guide the conservation of wildlife species to their habitat falls on all of us people of Illinois, in my opinion, for our future. So that is all my contact information. And I see that there are several questions in the thing. So some of the questions, I guess, is do state departments of wildlife have to work together? Animals move, so, do, so does Illinois. Um, have to communicate with Michigan or Indiana or Wisconsin, um, in which case, yes. I mean, that particular, think of the elk that was um, found on the side of the road in, I think, 88. Um, that elk we know was from Wisconsin. Uh, we have a bear that's constantly moving between in Illinois and Wisconsin. Um, so we do talk with the Wisconsin DNR. Um, Michigan DNR and Indiana DNR on occasion, but they're more... Um, I'm sure along the Indiana border, <laughs> I'm sure we talked to Michigan or Indiana more, um, but I know I'm I'm in the Chicagoland region. Um, and I do know we do talk to other DNR agencies as well. Um, second question was, uh, do state management plans sometimes conflict with each other? As much as I'd love to say no, of course not. <sighs> yeah, we're, we all do, in my opinion, granted, I believe that we all are trying to do what's in the best interest of our state, of our counties, of our individual areas of expertise. So sometimes it's interesting because sometimes the management plan for wildlife may not be what the management plan for forestry has. Um, that's where why we do things like um, plan of works to try to bring things together, um, to try to better um coordinate our efforts um i think debbie or lorelei if, if there's um other questions that you're seeing i just see the q a so i can go through keep going through this if you want um otherwise i know we're we have a few minutes but i know you said i think you said that um the q a is fine you can keep going okay um so uh, another question was, um, how does DNR support indigenous people's access to Illinois wildlife? Again, the wildlife is a um, public trust. So whether you're an indigenous people um, or if you are an immigrant from um, Poland, if you are in a legal resident of the state of Illinois, you can purchase a habitat stamp and a hunting license and be able to enjoy the resource just as much if you're, regardless of your, your heritage. Um, so we do have that. I know me personally, um, well, I won't go into that, um, but there is, there is um, equal support across the line, regardless of, um, of your, your ethnic background. Uh, is there a similar act to the Lacey Act in other nations? That I honestly cannot answer. I don't know. Um, I know the if, when it comes to the North American Wildlife Code of Co um, Conservation, that was unique to Illinois, I, or was unique to North America. Um, I do think other nations started seeing it um i thought down in south america um there were a couple of places that started interact uh using that as well but it was unique to north america um 
but I cannot say with any certainty what other nation might use it, um, if any other nation does. Uh, another question was, all of the laws are very interesting. If you were asked for advice on revision of legislation that protects Illinois wildlife, what would it be? Wow. Um, I don't think I, I think that would, that will take me actually thinking about that because the way we have the laws written right now are very, very general so that the species can still be protected and we can monitor it literally on an annual basis and make adjustments as we need to every single year if needed. But we also make five-year plans or even longer um, in order to try to help um, repopulate areas um, or if we see some areas being too high, like for example, the chronic wasting disease in the deer in the northern portion of the state. We have areas that are chronic wasting disease counties, like pretty much the northern half, northern third of the state is now called CW, you know, is within the CWD zone. So we, you can actually get pretty much unlimited amount of tags in these northern areas. Now that's completely different down south because those populations of deer down south are much different. They're not as, excuse me, not as densely populated. So there's not as much um, potential for the spread of chronic wasting disease because they aren't coming in contact with each other as much. So we have fewer permits down south than we do up north. So I think we do a great job so far at protection, but beyond that, um, I'd have to think about that. So great question, whoever asked that. Um, so some Canada geese no longer migrate. When animals, when animal, or another question is some um, Canada geese no longer migrate. When animal behavior changes like that, how does that impact how you manage those animals? Um, so we do, have things like we can open the um a different kind of hunting season for um conservation um i think it's called a conservation order so here's our new digest um and all it takes for finding that one out yep is to open up the digest to whatever page might be appropriate in this case waterfowl um, so there is a conservation order like geese, and that allows you to go um, goose hunting for snow, Ross and blue from January 19th all the way through April 30th. However, if you're like me and you just enjoy Canada goose, um, right now it's just until, it was just until January 18th. So there are, we do have the ability to open up um, different kinds of um, hunting regimes to be able to manage these animals um, like you like you noticed. Um, another question, what is the criteria used to issue nuisance permits? Um, for nuisance permits, first and foremost, it has to have monetary property damage. Without monetary property damage, I cannot legally define that animal as a nuisance, so I cannot legally give a permit. So that's step one. Um, and that's pretty much the biggest <laughs> step there is, honestly. Um, you have to have it on your property. You can't go on trespass and go on other people's properties. There's other minutia, but that's kind of the biggest criteria um, that there is for nuisance permits. Um, it looks like one, two, three, just a few other questions. Um, question that they don't know if I can answer, but what should we do if we hit a deer? Um, there was the, the question, person asking the question said that they saw um, a deer run into a car ahead of them um, a couple of weeks ago and they didn't know what to do and unfortunately it did pass. So perfect example of, um, of that, that human interaction, whether we want it or not. Um, they do, you can go online at that Illinois DNR um, site and get a salvage um, permit. I don't know if I can find it fast enough. Um, 
but I might be able to. Um, but there's that you can jump online and do a salvage permit. Um, that way, at least the animal is being able to be used. Um, and if you've never tried venison, it might be a perfect um, way to try it. Uh, I just do recommend, of course, I'm a mom. So I recommend get any venison that you do hit or harvest, whatnot. Um, do get it tested for CWD, in which case, call me and I can work with you on that. But you just jump online um, and get a salvage tag. I think it's really as simple as dnr.illinois.gov. Um, and here, claim a roadkill deer. So it's literally that quick. Um, so that's how you can get that information. Um, why does it see, another question says, why does it seem like every time they report a cougar in Chicago metro area, it ends up getting shot and not tranquilized and relocated? Great question. Um, because I asked the same thing in 2010. And it wasn't until I started working here that I realized the reason. Um, whenever you, so tr when you try to tranquilize an animal, you need to know a lot of very specific things. And the weight is one of the biggest things, weight and, and um, uh, respiratory um, kind of condition. So if there's a vet out there, by all means, jump in. But I'm going to assume that there may not be any vet veterinarians out there that would be able to go into better detail than me. But the short of it is you need, just like if you were going into um, the hospital for surgery, they need to know your weight, whether you're male or female. Um, a lot of different things, right? We have, whenever you go into surgery, you get all that list of stuff and they test a whole bunch of things before you go into surgery. And that's because they need that anesthesia to be a very specific amount. Um, they also need to know how long you're expected to go be under so that they have the correct dosage. Dosing is huge. So if you tranquilize an animal without knowing how much they weigh, without knowing if they're male or female, what their um, respiratory conditions are and, and the heart rates and metabolic rates and all that, you're not going to get the dosage needed correctly. So one of two things basically happens. Either you don't dose it high enough and you go in thinking that they're asleep when really they're not, and they may be groggy, tired, exhausted, confused, hungry. I'd like all the things, if you've ever gone through surgery, imagine waking up, but now being outside. Uh, it's not a happy thing. Um, if you overdo it, then there is the potential of them running off somewhere and we not necessarily being able to find it. So um, the one case where we had a collared cougar, I think it was last year, we were able to at least tranquilize that one because the collar allowed us to know exactly where it went. When you tranquilize an animal, it's not just like three, two, one, and it drops. It takes a while to go through the whole system before it goes to sleep. So it can run under another resident's fence or, or porch or whatnot, the deck, um, and we don't find it or know where it is. And when it wakes up, it's, like I said, groggy, dizzy, tired, hungry, confused, nothing is making sense to it and it emerges from under the fence and all of a sudden there's a child right in front of it. We above all else do not want to ever have to be in that position um, for the animal or for the humans involved. So it really depends on the location um, as well. The location, especially the, like you said, that very urban metro area. Um, that's when it gets very difficult unless it does have the collar, in which case the one in Springfield, we were able to tranquilize and relocate that one. So, yay, recently, sorry for 2010. Um, so uh, just the observation of the CWD data was stunning. Thank you. I'm literally in the throes of it right now. Um, and the last question that I have is, so what is the plan to sustain conservation efforts if the revenue continues to drop to license decrease uh, and, can, and the license revenues continue to decrease? I um, guess we need to get more young people outdoors. So unfortunately, 
um, we really right now, as far as I know, don't have an answer. I am super fortunate to um, just recently, well, about, I guess almost a year ago now, we do have an, a boss now. I do have a, a supervisor who whose job is R3, so re recruitment, retention, and reactivation. So getting people, recruiting people to the outdoors, reactivating those people who were outdoors and maybe you know fell off the radar, so to speak. Like you may have hunted at one point in time, you went to college and life happened and you're no longer hunting. That's what reactivation is, trying to get you back out to the field and get that. Um, recruitment, reactivation, and retention. Then, of course, trying to keep you hunting through the those college years and, and life happening years. Um, we realize it happens, but yeah, that's that's the hard part. Um, we've tried binocular tax in the Senate and legislation, and that's failed. We've tried different kinds of state taxes, you know, use use taxes. So if you try to go to a state park, can you pay? Or you need to pay to get into the park. Um, I think Indiana Dunes now does that. So during their high peak volumes types seasons, um, they're even doing a usage tax um, with Indiana Dunes. So, I mean, but that's failed because we don't want to, we want to try to encourage more participation in outdoor events. So having usage fees, the state senators found that to be um, not ideal. So, I mean, you're right. That is a huge problem. Um, thank God I have a supervisor who <laughs> hopefully he can come up with some brilliant ideas and maybe start to change um, the trajectory. But that's that's what the R3 push across the nation is really about is to try to get more people outdoors. And I think that's all of the questions. Did I miss any of them, ladies? No, I think you're all good. I think you answered all of them. Well, thank you, thank you. for everything and for the entire webinar. We appreciate it so much. Oh, of course. And I have no thank idea how to stop sharing my thing. <laughs> oh. Have a good rest of your day. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.